thank you everyone for for joining uh this workshop and um i wish it was under better circumstances and uh you know this was obviously in person um but one thing that i found is it's a little reassuring that the trees uh they haven't noticed uh the virus so they keep going um so this is my backyard uh and in this backyard i have a mother block uh so this is 25 trees that are growing about 150 different varieties of heirloom and antique fruit and as opposed to a typical orchard i grow these for harvesting for scion wood or grafting material as opposed to necessarily fruit and it poses its own sort of challenges doing that um, but in many of the same ways i treat them as fruit bearing trees so um yeah i thought i would start off by talking about pests and disease management and then um we can shift over to talking about grafting afterwards um so like all of my workshops i seem to start with a lot of uh caveats or excuses um i've been doing this for about 10 years but i in no way consider myself an expert um and that's largely because every year i seem to learn something new uh and i'm introduced to something new with the trees i in in caring for trees i aim for or i treat them all organically and if possible i aim for just sort of holistic uh sort of orchard practices and i have the luxury of not having to depend on growing fruit trees or growing fruit to make a living um so in that way i can be a little bit more experimental um with what i do so in terms of treating pests and uh, diseases, usually I find that any sort of pest or disease is a symptom of a larger issue. And that generally starts with the site and the soil. So in selecting a site for trees, what I'll do is I look for a high point um, within a yard or wherever you, you plan to place the tree. And um, if, you know, come short of that, what I'll do is a raised planter or I'll even do a, um, a berm. So you can actually see, it might be harder to see, but these trees are all planted about four to six inches above the soil line on a berm. And a lot of that is to, to raise the tree up. Fruit trees don't necessarily like to have what they call wet feet. Uh, they don't like to be saturated in water, particularly apricots and peaches. Um, apples plums tend to be a little bit more resilient to that but you want a place where the water is going to be able to run off the tree pretty regular or pretty readily in addition to that you want a place where the air is going to be able to run off so you don't want to have the tree in a contained uh, sort of location and you want to make sure that there's ample airflow that goes through and they call that uh, atmospheric drainage so those are kind of the the primary considerations when i'm thinking about placing a tree these trees are all uh they run east to west and that way they can get full sun uh, throughout the majority of the day which is another consideration and um these are all sort of semi-dwarfing trees which means that they're going to probably get eventually to a span of about you know probably about 12 feet so these trees um what I do is I prune them pretty hard. They grow about six to eight feet in a growing season. And then what I'll do is prune them down so really they only grow one feet a year. And I'll take all of the clippings, I'll cut them and I'll store them in this bag. Um, so also other considerations as I'm starting to think about where I wanna place a tree, I'll test the soil you can have your soil tested at um usually cornell's cooperative extension has resources for you on testing the soil and that's it's really critical uh to actually do that for trees i find that the more investment i put into the soil that's less time i have to take care of the tree later so in um prepping the soil um i look for a spot that's a minimum very much minimum like four feet in circumference and generally what i'll do is i'll turn the soil up in the fall uh or i'll turn it up in the spring in anticipation of a fall planting uh also what i'll do is i'll either put compost onto that spot or i'll uh use uh cover planting so you can put in a, a cover plant of um alfalfa clover 
uh, vetch, anything along those lines. And what that'll do is it'll start to ready the soil for planting in fall. So um, ideally fruit trees like a sandy loam soil. So what that is, is that's equal parts clay, salt, or silt, <laughs> not salt, clay, uh, silt, and uh, sand. And again, apple trees uh, will uh, can take a heavier soil, which means that uh, a heavier clay-based soil, apricots and peaches like a, a more sandy soil. If you have to grow in a container, um, that's highly doable with fruit trees. And basically a soil mix that I'll look for with a container is to do 40% uh, peat, or the other thing that I've started to use recently is cocoa peat. 30% uh, compost, 20% vermiculite, 10% perlite. Um, so hey Sam. Then, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, <laughs> I got um, a 10 minute warning notice from Zoom. Okay. So I think we're on like 40 minute increments. So if we get oh, cut off, okay. I've instructed everyone to just re-click the link to log back in and we should be able to resume. Okay, great. Yeah, um, okay, great. So do we have about 10 minutes? We have about 10 minutes and I also got a request to, um, for you to say those soil part percentages again and I can put them into the chat. Okay, um, so uh, soil percentages for containers are 40% peat or cocoa peat, 30% compost, so make sure that's aged compost. 20% vermiculite and 10% perlite. And that's for containers. Um, for, uh, for ground soil, what I'll do is I'll, uh, you know, I'll mix in sand, make sure the sand is washed. Um, sometimes you, you know, a lot of mine sand is, uh, unless it's washed, it tends to be pretty acidic. And then the other thing is you can either mix in peat or cocoa peat into the soil or hardwood mulch, anything that makes it uh, more uh, friable, right? So it makes it uh, easier to work. So um, with these 10 minutes, um, in talking about pest and disease management, um, a lot of the information that I work from, it's either from old agricultural manuals. So those were ones that were from the 19th century or early 20th century, or I work uh, from a lot of, um, sort of contemporary holistic practices. But the one thing that I find that's pretty interesting is both sources talk about this idea of good culture. And it's this idea that culture is something that's um, amended or it's something that's sort of cared for, um, which I think is pretty interesting as an artist because you tend to think of culture as something that's existed rather than, than something that you care. So in terms of sort of best practices, I. I find like the thing that that kind of keeps me going and then um, also the thing I find kind of rewarding with growing fruit trees is that it ties you into sort of the rhythms and cycles of the trees themselves. So I set a calendar um, and so I have a calendar that tells me pretty much when I need to be doing things in the orchard um, and I, I pretty I relied on it pretty regularly the first few years but now it's just uh, sort of become part of the practice. There's a good resource. Um, we're going to talk about different ways that you can do minimum treatment, which is sort of what I tend to do. And then uh, there's a good resource on the Holistic Orchard Network site that has a, a pretty fantastic calendar um, uh, that lays out the entire year of what you, what you should be doing. But um, I think we'll just kind of start with the calendar year and go from there. So in January, what I will do is that's my time to prune. So I'll come out here in mid-January. And as I mentioned, these trees are all six to eight feet tall and I'll prune them way back. Um, and what I'll, I, I really aim to do with these trees is to have them grow um, to cause as many uh, scaffolding branches to come off as possible. And those are what I harvest for all of the grafting. And what it looks like is something like this. So really, you know, the aim for looking for grafting material, and this is where the term mother block comes from, right? These are the mothers of other trees that are gonna be grown. Um, and again, what I'm looking for is sort of pencil width uh, material. 
So um, also um, what I'm looking for in January is I'm looking at the trees specifically and kind of like looking into these, uh, the undersides of, of where the branches come off. And I'm looking for any type of um, overwintering insects that might be nested in here. Sometimes, occasionally, you'll find um, a moth's nest that, that's in here. And um, yeah, I'll try to start taking out those. So people tend to think that pruning only happens once a year, but I probably do it about three or four times. Um, what I'll do is I'll prune them in January, and that's really the shaping uh, pruning. But then after that, what I'll do is it right after petal fall, um, and, and you get that first cover of the trees and leaves. If they're apple trees, I'll look for um, signs of any kind of blight. Uh, usually you can tell, uh, you know, you can tell the signs of blight and you can uh, prune out those sections. I'll also, on plum trees, I'll look for any black knot that starts to form. And black knot is kind of this, these warts that form on the underside of the branch. And those tend to come with, uh, if you have a pretty wet spring, which tends to happen here in Syracuse. And then finally, the other pruning that I'll do is during summer. Uh, and a lot of that is sort of directional pruning. So what I'll do is these branches that uh, during the summer, anything that goes into the center of the tree, I'll start to prune out. And with my trees, what, what I like to do, uh, and it, I think it's specific, to uh, doing multi-grafted trees. Um, I try to have an open center. So all this area is, uh, is open to allow sunlight to come in. But then the other thing as it relates to pest management is it opens the tree up so that the air can move through pretty readily. And what that does is that's gonna help cut down on a lot of fungal problems that I have and a lot of bacterial problems. So it just kind of, as long as the air keeps moving through, again, that's less fungicide that you have to put on the tree, um, if at all. So, um, so after I uh, prune the trees in January and then I, um, I collect all the scion wood, uh, then pretty much I don't have um, too much to do until March. Um, my season's a little, I'm about a, probably about three weeks behind you guys uh, in New York City. Um, all right, you can store them in any kind of plastic bag, uh, any one that, that you can seal. And um, I just had, I bought these specifically because I'll go through hundreds a year, uh, but a Ziploc bag would be fine. You take, this is just an old wa washcloth that was cut up into small pieces, and um, I dip them in distilled water <laughs> and wring them out. That's, that's still even a little too wet and place that in the bag. And then I'll store them in um, a refrigerator that's set anywhere from 36 to about 40 degrees. And I try to make sure that it's a dedicated refrigerator. Um, and um, because sometimes a lot of vegetables can off gas. So if your, your bags aren't sealed well, they, um, you know, you'll, you'll start to, uh, you know, you can actually contaminate the material so that you don't, they won't graft as well. Um, in terms of when to start pruning a tree, usually what I'll do, um, so like this cut right here was made probably when the tree was about two years old. Um, and I, you know, so it grows about two and a half feet and I'll make it, a, they call it a heading cut. And that heading cut is made so that um, it actually starts to create these scaffolding branches that come off of the base. So it was, I think I, was that all the questions? Um, I is there a minimum age at the age for the trees at which pruning should begin? Does it make a difference if they're in containers? Um, no, no, it doesn't make a difference whether they're in the ground or containers. Um, usually I'll grow, um, so way behind me is um, I have a bunch of stock in containers and usually that's you know those are two years old when I start to shape them um, sometimes it's three years depending on how vigorous the growth is in them so yeah either way you're looking at, at year one or two and that's 
two years from the time that you do the graft, the initial bench graft, which we'll we'll talk about in a little bit. So, no, no, we're, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my wife's holding the cue card, so that's why I'm making weird pictures. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, okay, so we're, we're back to March. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is put in uh, tree spreaders, uh, which I don't know if you saw when it got cut off, but I use these uh, tree spreaders, um, you know, find them online. I get them from an a orchard in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, cause I like the metal ones for some reason, they sell plastic ones, but I'm not as big on them. And what I'll do is I just start putting in these, um, to start forming the tree even more. And what this does is it kind of keeps pushing the tree out and down. Uh, Asian plum varieties in particular, they just want to go straight up. So you have to kind of keep pushing them out, uh, to continue to get the open center. And, um, I'm not sure if you caught it, but I was talking about uh, apple trees and, and one of the ways that they grow apple trees now, it's pretty, it's kind of crazy. Um, they'll grow them on this super dwarfing rootstock so that the tree is only six to eight feet tall. And so it's a central leader that has uh, short scaffolding branches that come off the side um, and they grow them sort of three feet apart. And it's more like uh, growing wine or grapevines than it is, uh, you know, how we would tend to think of a standard apple tree, which is 40 to 50 feet tall. So the other, um, the other thing that I'll do starting in, uh, in March is I'll go through and I'll take off all the tree guards. So I put tree guards on in the winter. Generally, I'll, I'll, I'll put them on in October. And that does two things um, primarily. One is um, it prevents the trees from getting what they call southwest sun injury. So uh, during the winter, when the sun's sitting lower, it comes in at such an angle that it can damage the trunk. And when it damages the trunk, that's going to lead to cankers that you're going to get on the tree. So I'll put them on to prevent southwest sun. And then the other thing uh, that they do is they prevent uh, rodents from girdling the tree, which I never had a problem with until this year. <laughs> there were two small trees that I had uh, in my rootstock nursery uh, that I didn't have a chance to, uh, to put tree guards on and they got uh, girdled, which actually works out really well for the demo. Um, because we're going to graph those and try to remedy that. Um, finally, um, the other thing that I do, particularly like with this, with a mother block nursery, I'm, I'm looking for places where I can uh, graft more uh, varieties. So this is just an idiosyncratic thing. I'll start to come through and I'll start to tag the trees of where I'm going to pl place the grafts. And it's not necessarily something that's critical or important, but what it does for me is it enables me to start thinking about where the graft is going to go and how, you know, how it's going to, how many varieties I can get on here and then um, start planning out, go through my refrigerator, plan out all the grass for the season. So um, that kind of is my March schedule for, you know, for you, that's beginning of March. For me, that's more end of March. And um, the other thing, usually, I mean, what you, you would probably be looking at the last week in March to do the next step, um, which is uh, re removing and replacing mulch. So one of the things that I would love to be able to do here that I can't necessarily is uh, plant a cover crop. And, you know, as I mentioned before, that's uh, clover, alfalfa, vetch. Um, the other uh, amazing cover crop you can do is uh, beans, uh, like black-eyed peas. Typically you would plant those uh, in August. You would let them sit throughout the, uh, the winter and then uh, March, April, you would take them and you would till them back into the soil and that's known as green manuring. And um, it's a complementary planting process uh, where all of those plants that I listed are actually nitrogen fixers. So what they'll do is they absorb uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere 
and they convert it into nitrogen that the roots of the trees can then uh, take in and use for growth. And nitrogen is like the big thing that pushes trees uh, for, for growth. So, you know, in other places where I have trees, what I'll do is I'll turn over the cover crop. The reason I don't do it here is um, because I found after doing it for a few years, I was starting to damage the roots. There isn't enough space around them. Um, if you're working in a small plot that's like four by four and you can hand weed, great. Um, you know, I would say, you know, consider one of those cover crops. Uh, short of that, uh, other things that you can do are like I we I have my lilac uh, bush that's planted right next to the uh, the nursery, so that's another uh, nitrogen fixer that's in the area. Um, but what I do here is I actually in March April what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll turn over all of this mulch. I'll take off half of it and um, I replace it with new mulch. And the reason for turning it over and replacing it with with new mulch is that a lot of your overwintering insects are going to fall from the tree and get down into that bark mulch and you want to turn that over so they're exposed to the sun which kills them off or or by removing it i take it and essentially compost it so that kills them as well um another thing is using hardwood mulch i don't use any mulch that has um anything other than deciduous trees and the reason for that is it develops this um there's you can kind of see it if you pull it up so there's a there's a white fungus that uh starts to develop as the hardwood mulch breaks down and that helps assist uh mycorrhizal fun fungi in um in feeding the trees and we, we'll talk about that in a little bit so um so that's kind of my end of march beginning of april and um so i think the other thing that I'll start to do around um, this time is start to really consider other complementary plants. So complementary planting works really well in doing a few things. One is it's going to repel certain insects. It's going to attract certain beneficial insects. Um, it's going to fertilize your plants. It's going to conserve water. Uh, it'll prevent weeds. And with a lot of um, things like even um, comfrey and, and certain plants like that, they, it turns into this amazing, amazing mulch. So um, comfrey is a dynamic accumulator. So what that means is that it's going to mine deep down into the soil and it'll pick up trace elements and minerals that the tree needs that have passed through it, right? So you're watering your trees. When you're watering your trees or over watering your trees in particular, you're washing out all the nutrients and minerals and those dynamic accumulators uh, will actually help you regain some of that and it turns into a really good beneficial uh, beneficial mulch. Um, the other thing is uh, some other dynamic accumulators are uh, horsetail, nettle, and um, along with comfrey can be things that you, you turn into um, teas that, that can help uh, add a some uh, nutrients back to the tree. Uh, if you're looking at native plants, amaranth, uh, yarrow, sweet sicily are all native uh, and um, indigenous to New York, so you can um, so you can use those. So the other thing that you can do is plantings around um, any of your trees. So whether that's like it working in a larger space like this, or working on the borders or perimeters. Um, you can use pest confusers. So these are things that either repel or confuse uh, insects to keep them away. So uh, allium is, or anything that falls into uh, like onions, garlic, chives, le leeks um, are all uh, good pest repellents. In addition, you can also plant marigold, basil, rosemary, lavender. Um, so those are all kind of your pest repellent or confusers. And then you have pest attractors, which are your bee balm, sunflower, um, anything that's going to draw sort of bees into the, uh, you know, towards the plants. So, um, so now we're at, um, we're at April and actually, so maybe even towards the end of March, a lot of what I do is determined by degree day calendars. So the thing with fruit trees is, 
they need a certain number of cold days. That's days below 40 degrees or 45 degrees to go into dormancy. And then they need a certain number of days to come out of dormancy. So and th those are called chilling hours and warming hours. And I'll try to figure out how many warming hours uh, the trees have had in the spring. So that's days above 45 degrees. And by doing that calculation, I can figure out when the trees are gonna start to blossom. And the reason that's important is not just to be able to tell when the trees are gonna blossom, but it's gonna tell you also when the insects are gonna start to emerge. And at that point, what I'll do right before the trees are gonna start to do bud swell. So that's before these buds start to open up. What I'll do is I'll apply my last dormant spray. So in a normal year, what I'll do is I will spray um, with sulfur. Um, and sort of like every third or fourth year, I'll apply copper to the trees. And what that does is that takes care of the majority of fungal issues that I'm gonna have uh, throughout the year. So that's gonna take care of black knot. So that's that warty, warty mass that, that occurs under the tree. It's gonna take care of brown rot. So if you see your fruit starting to get these brown spots on the side of it, um, that's gonna take care of peach leaf curl. That's when the peaches emerge and they start to look like somebody crumpled them. Uh, shot hole. And shot hole looks like somebody took a shotgun and shot it through your tree. It puts all these tiny little holes. Um, dieback, gamosis, mildew are all kind of taken care of that with stone fruit trees. And um, with apple trees, what it does is it helps pre prevent fire blight, fly speck, um, blotch, and apple scab. So important things are, you know, trying to get the timing right on the spring. Uh, you do not ever, ever, ever want to spray a tree with anything while it's blossoming. Like, you are going to kill those beneficial insects, um, most importantly bees. And um, the other things with spraying are, you know, I try to do it either in, you know, first thing in the morning or do it at night. Uh, so that way it doesn't burn off from the sun. And additionally, what you'll want to do is you know, try to find a day, find a window in there where there's three days where it's not going to rain. So the, th the thing, both sulfur and copper are both considered organic, but they, they both have um, some drawbacks. Uh, you know, sulfur, even though it's OMRI, it's still oh. considered toxic. Sorry about that. That's my dog who's supposed to be like good pest control, but I don't, we'll talk about that later. Um, and the other thing with copper is copper, if sprayed over and over, can um, actually, uh, you know, start to develop in the soil and start to contaminate the soil and start to kill any type of beneficial fungus that you have around the roots. So typically what I'll do is I'll do that dormant spray and then I only do apply neem oil or horticultural oil as needed. Now, if I'm really concerned about um, growing fruit, what I'll do is I'll do five applications of neem oil. And I can't say enough great things about neem oil. You wanna use pure neem. Um, in addition to acting as an insecticide, as a uh, fungicide to some extent, um, it also is believed to activate the immune system of the tree. So it's good to get an early spray of those on. Um, so after I do that sulfur spray when the trees are still dormant, after they get to the point where they're, they call it a quarter green, that means that you get a quarter inch of green growth on the tree. Uh, you apply, I'll apply neem again. Um, after they blossom, or as the buds start to swell before they blossom, I, I'll apply neem again. After the petal fall, I'll apply neem again. And then after they get that first real cover of leaves, I'll apply um, neem. And a, a lot of that is specifically for apple trees and um, trying to deal with coddling moth and, and trying to prevent that. In addition to that, it'll take care of any type of aphids, thrips, uh, mites, uh, boars that you'll have that'll start to go into the, the trees. And um, yeah, again, coddling moth. 
after, Sam, um, yeah. Sam, we, we have a couple questions. Is now a good okay. time to? Sure. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I um, like the questions. It's good. <laughs> okay. It interrupts the madness. <laughs> All right. I'm going to work backwards through the questions so that we, okay. Uh, okay. Is there a particular kind of sulfur or copper and how much since you said it can be a contaminant? That's like really, 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 really good question. Okay. Related um, is how do you apply these things? Okay. Yeah, we're going to get into applying in a couple minutes, um, but I'll, you know, I'll talk to, about uh, copper. So um, it used to be pretty traditional to make uh, Bordeaux mix. So Bordeaux mix was uh, a mix of dehydrated lime, copper sulfate, uh, and water. So that's like a 10, 10, 100 part mix of that. Um, but the thing that I found is that unless you get, they call it suspended copper, right? Um, so that's held in with like a binder uh, that's, uh, that keeps the copper suspended in the liquid that you're applying to the tree, that the copper runs off really readily. And you'll know it's suspended copper because you can kind of see the stuff is, um, you know, it's kind of that sort of blue that happens when copper oxidizes. So you always want to look for uh, suspended copper. In terms of sulfur, uh, basically the mixture on that, you'll buy the copper uh, dry. And um, you mix generally one cup to you one buy the copper gallon. or the sulfur dry? Oh, the, the, the sulfur dry. The copper I always buy suspended. So I buy this kind of copper fungicide. The, um, you know, sulfur I'll get dry and it's usually like one part to one gallon or one cup to one gallon and use a paint mixer. And um, in terms of like how much to apply, we'll go over that in a few minutes. Um, and I'll show you how to apply it so that you're not overspraying. Um, you know, again, with, with applying the copper, the one thing with the suspended copper, what it does is that as you spray it, um, it's going to stick to the tree more readily than separate from it and fall down. So. All right. Thanks, Sam. I hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> I'm going to um, go over that again. <laughs> okay. During the demo and then moving yeah. back through the. Um, a couple of your earlier topics, how close um, to the tree trunk do you plant the complementary plants? Okay, so um, you can go right up to the, the tree trunk um, with some, with, uh, you know, with like clover, alfalfa, anything like that. Um, basically with, um, if, I, if I'm looking at planting any type of uh, garlic, um, onions, that sort of thing. I'll usually do that around the border of, of where it is. And then all of the other sort of attractors uh, and repellents, uh, you know, I just keep them in proximity of the tree. So I'm not going to plant like sort of, li although, um, you know, lilacs would look really nice in the center of this. I'm, you know, the roots are going to get pretty deep, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, can you use, what else can you use instead of the metal tree spreader for folks who don't have, can you use a piece of wood? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. All right. Um, got, hold on one second. Um, I can show you, I learned this is like an old orchard trick. Um, so as you're, uh, you're pruning your trees, what you do is you can take extra, these are a little bit too small. What you look for branches that are five sixteenth to about three quarters of an inch thick, and you start to twist them. And you'll do this when they're they're wet. And what I can do is I can come in and I can start using the tension that exists between the branches to to push them apart. Um, I can probably get well. I'll use some of these. We'll use these for grafting, but we can use them now. So these are kind of perfect size for, for making spreaders. Um, All right, so. And what you do is you just use the tension 
between them to push the branches apart like that. Um, the other thing you can do is just take a piece of wood and put like two little brad nails in the end. And what that does is it just, there's enough tension to, to push them apart. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Um, last question for this round of Q&A is um, if a tree, a plum, for example, is already grown pretty tall, is it possible to reshape to open and how much is too much to cut off? Okay, they see, um, yeah, that's... Uh, that might be a longer... Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. All right, so if you, you know, you can get away with a lot if you're going to prune when the tree is dormant. Um, so that we're looking at like January, so dead of winter uh, to go out and you can head the tree off. And what I would say is if it's a huge plum tree that you want to start working back, just take a, you can get away easily with a third. So think about the entire tree height. You can take off the top third. And so if it's a really large tree, you'd want to start doing that in successive years. So that's right. my answer. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> back to pest management. I guess. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for all your awesome questions. <laughs> no, these are great. And thank you. Keep them coming because I... This is weird doing a live stream because you're like, am I talking to anyone? So, um, yeah, it's a lot different than a, a normal uh, sort of workshop. So um, other things that I'm looking to do in April are um, I'll go through and if I have any trees that develop canker. So what canker is, is um, it generally occurs two ways that it occurs. One is if the trees are sitting in a lot of wet soil. And then also it comes from injury during the winter. So that's, you know, something runs into it, cuts it, that'll start to develop into a wound. And it's pretty indicative when you start to get sap that pours out of it. In addition to that, the bark that's around it starts to peel back. And so what I'll do is I'll take a paint scraper and I'll just go in and it's, I don't want to like get back to green bark, but I can take the paint scraper and get those big sort of um, any type of bark that that's peeled off. And the reason why I want to take that back and push it back is that a lot of insects are going to get in there to either bore or overwinter. So that's a way that you can kind of cut that out. Um, so actually, hold on a second. I think we need to go back one. Oh, we lost that one. Oh, <laughs> uh, don't. Sorry, I have notes going. <laughs> um, nope. Okay, we're on that one. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the other thing um, that I'll say just sort of about spraying. Um, so just in case, just to clarify, what I'll do is primarily I'll spray with sulfur, right? And um, sulfur, it's usually mixed one cup to one gallon. Uh, I sp I'll spray that in early spring while the trees are still dormant. If I'm worried about fruit production, I'll then shift over and start spraying with neem. And I'll spray that as the, the buds start to go, as the blossoms start to form. I'll do after the blossom, like after the petals fall from the blossom, I'll spray again. And then I would spray again after green cover. Um, and so that's when it really starts to leaf out. At that point, I'm not applying any more uh, neem. Typically, what I'll do after that point to control any pests or diseases that might occur throughout the summer, from that point forward, I switch over to horticultural oil, which is just an oil that I can use to control insects. Generally, what happens by summer solstice, any problem that your tree has, if it's fungal, um, it you're that's the year right it's it's something that can only be remedied at it you know later in dormancy and um so yeah that's why i'll only use horticultural oil and that'll control aphids and it'll control uh any type of beetles but i'll also give you other ways to start thinking about that so um you know, still in april this is like your busiest time um what you're going to do is uh fertilize the trees 
generally all I'll do to fertilize is just bring in um, fresh compost on the trees. Uh, if I feel like a tree needs some help, one of the things that I'll do is I use fish emulsion, uh, which you can find pretty readily. And that seems to give the trees the nitrogen boost that they really need to get going. Uh, the other thing that you can do uh, in, in April as the trees start to blossom, and you, you don't want to fertilize before they start to push green growth because you could actually kick them into starting blossom too soon. Um, so you want to wait till you see the growth, and at that point you can apply fertilizers, and at that point you can apply uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungi which is actually a beneficial fungus, which forms uh, in colonies along the roots of the tree and helps break down and make nutrients available to the tree. And that's something that I, I saw as being something that was more, um, you know, holistic orchard practice, but now that's actually started to become a practice with, um, with commercial orchards as well. And what they'll do is they'll bore down about six to eight inches next to the tree and, uh, you know, apply the, the fungus in there. So, hey, Sam. Yeah. Uh, first thing is that we got another 10 minute warning. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll do that again. And then we have some questions about the oil. Um, does neem oil work for leaf curl? And is the horticultural oil diluted? Yeah, so um, I, I don't know. I had a problem last year with leaf curl. Like I had a, a problem with leaf curl and um, shot hole. And the year before I tried to head it off with a couple of dormant sprays of neem oil, which didn't work. So this year I actually, uh, I do two dormant sprays. One is in October, one is in March. And um, this year I, I use copper. And typically I will try to avoid using copper whenever possible. But, um, but this year, after having a couple different um, fungal issues, I use it. Hypothetically, if it isn't a bad or severe case, um, you can get away with using neem oil for, for peach leaf curl. Where you know, if you're located around uh, around the city, you can most likely use it. I have to use copper sometimes because I'm trying to grow peach trees in Syracuse, New York, which is not, um, yeah, which is which is pretty tough. And then um, generally, yes, like I buy like the industrial size of the horticultural oil. Um, and uh, you mix it, any, any of these that you buy, they'll have the mixing instructions on there. I think it's something like two tablespoons per gallon. So it, it's not a very um, concentrated solution. Okay, and then what was the name of the beneficial fungus and is there any, are there any concerns about sulfur harming the beneficial mycorrhizal fungi? Yep, I mean, that, that's the thing with any type of fungicide that you apply to the tree, um that's that's what you you risk right is is damming the beneficial fungi so a lot of that depends on the application and and we can talk we'll talk about that again um you know as we you know as as i demonstrate the spraying um so it's mycorrhizal it's m-i-c-c-o-r-h-i-z-a-l and um you can find um you know the a lot of uh, nursery supplies will will be able to sell you that, and it it turns out to be pretty amazing. Like there are trees I thought that I had lost that I was I was able to bring back, and a lot, you know, anytime you're trying to grow in challenging soils, it's it really helps trees uh, get the nutrients that they need. So are we? How close are we to our ten minute? Um. Let's see. We got it at 11.45 and now it's 11.49. So we have oh, six we got more six minutes. minutes. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we talked about, uh, you know, spraying the neem um, till we get like that first cover. And, um, 
at that point, what you'll do is you'll start to see the the uh, fruit develop. Um, and then, you know, we're into May at this point. And what you're starting to look for is how your fruit is starting to set. So all of these tiny little round buds that are uh, growing on the tree are all potential fruit, right? And hopefully you've had some good pollinators that came through that have started to, to set the fruit. That is, they've been pollinated. And what I'm looking at at that point is I'm looking at um, how heavy the crop is setting. So trees, um, you know, in really good shape are going to set a lot of fruit, which means that you're going to get tons of fruit that are sitting on one branch. And at that point, what you do is holding out for what they call June drop. And June drop is when the tree kind of decides how many of those fruit it's going to keep and how many it's going to get rid of. Um, sometimes the tree will keep a lot of fruit and you get a very heavy set. So as you start to get into June, what you want to start thinking about after you see some fruit start to drop is thinning the, the, the fruit. And you do that because it'll cut down on any kind of fungus or bacteria that'll develop around the fruit. It'll help uh, each of the fruit varieties or each of the fruits start to get larger in size. And um, generally what I'll look at is any year I'll take 30 to 50% of the fruit set off of a tree. And um, you get a better tasting fruit from it. Okay. And then um, other things that you're starting to, to look to do in May are um, for, and they, this is all for apples, is uh, doing pheromone traps or sticky traps. Uh, and these are for a lot of different types of flies that'll come in and bore into the, the apple. So, you know, uh, an organic way to deal with that rather than spraying is to hang these traps. The other thing that I'll do, um, if, if I'm, you know, if I have some problems with, with coddling moth is I just take boards and I have one over here. Um, so if I have problems with moths or boars and stuff, I'll just go through and I'll just lay down um, boards next to the trees. And what happens is the coddling moth, it'll, um, the larva drop down out of the tree and before they become grubs, um, you know, they'll start to bore underneath uh, bark and branches, which you can pull these boards up at various times during the day and you can just pull them off. And then that way you don't have to, uh, to be spraying. And, um, or it helps if you're only controlling them with neem. It's also a way that, that helps, uh, you know, helps control them. Yeah, the other, you know, one other thing, uh, there's some other things you can do to help uh, with coddling moth with apples in May. You can put wire mesh around. Some people will wrap like, it's almost like a cardboard material around the trunk of the tree and um, use like a goo. Uh, I don't, you know, even honey works to, to catch uh, slugs and larvae from, from climbing up the tree. Um, then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the other thing that I'll start to look for as we move into June is I'll just keep summer pruning. So I'm trying to keep you know, I'll prune all the branches that are on the inside and try to keep everything kind of pushing outwards further and further. Um, it pretty much, I look at solstice as my, summer solstice as my cutoff. So that's when I'm, I really just switch over to all mechanical means of controlling pests. So um, there's, you know, some of the things that I've had are chipmunks, squirrels, uh, groundhog. Um, at my other nursery, I've had a situation where I came in and there was actually a groundhog in an apricot tree that was like upside down chewing on leaves. Um, and um, yeah, the I thought, you, you see my dog running around here, I thought he would be the way that I did pest control. But um, actually they just, uh, both of my dogs seem to like skunks, uh, not to prevent them from you know, doing anything, but just to get sprayed, so I have to clean them. Um, other sort of mechanical things that I'm doing with the trees um, is that, so so that I don't have to spray, um, are aphids. Uh, so aphids, uh, tiny, uh, green, black, sometimes yellow bugs, what they'll do is, um, 
you know, the, they're, they can actually be pretty damaging to a tree. What I find is that at the end of the night, ladybugs and ants actually herd the aphids into the top leaf on each branch. And so if I come out at dusk, I can just take off that top leaf um, and I just destroy that leaf. And that'll usually take care of the majority of my aphid problems. Same thing uh, if you have Japanese beetles that are, uh, you know, in affecting your tree, you can wait till dusk and you can generally just knock them off into a, into a paper cup. Um, and at that point from June, you know, through end of September, you know, it's just all of those different mechanical measures that you'll try to do to prevent the, the trees, um, you know, from having any damage. If you're going to do uh, any grafting, that would be in August. And then really the, you know, other than harvest, the next big thing that, that I'm concerned about uh, occurs in October, which is when I'll whitewash my trees if I'm going to do it. So generally what I'll do is I'll keep tree guards on trees till they get four or five years old. And at that point you can whitewash them. And so whitewash uh, was, it used to be made from water, salt and hydrated lime. Um, the, you know, or the other thing that you can use is a mixture of 50% um, latex paint and 50% water. And you just apply it, um, you know, we'll just go over here and I'll show you. So you, you just, um, it'll run on, it runs pretty readily. Um, you apply it about two feet up on the, the branch and you can see I, I've dug away the soil. Um, so what I'm trying to do is get behind any of the, um, so any of the bark that might be sticking out, make sure I get full coverage. You can see I pulled away the soil. And what I'm doing is, is I'm actually going probably like three to four inches below, at least below the graft knot, um, two to three inches below the soil line. And by doing that, what you're doing is you're taking out, um, any bores, uh, so there's bores that will will attack the roots, and you can kind of you know, take care of them using that. So that's whitewashing. Uh, you don't want to use um, uh, pure latex paint. You, you have to make sure that it's uh, watered down. So I'll do that in October while it's still warm. Uh, you know, a lot of this time frame is actually changing. Uh, due to changes that we're having in the weather. So I've uh, typically in October, what I do is I'd be looking to plant all my new trees. And, um, but now that gets even pushed into uh, November and actually a couple years ago was going into December. For uh, smaller trees, um, so I'll whitewash my larger trees, but then I'll also start to, um, to put tree guards onto to my smaller trees. And again, that's to uh, prevent girdling and southwest sun injury. I'll go through, I'll take out all of my tree spreaders because the tree spreaders, um, they can actually damage the branches, which is another source of uh, where you can, uh, you know, where you'll develop a canker on, on the branches. So at that point, um, I'll apply uh, my dormant spray. And if you're, if you're going to only spray once during the year, that fall dormant spray is the time to do it. Cause that's when you're going to get most of your, uh, overwintering insects. Um, they'll start to have, uh, bedded in, uh, for the winter, uh, you know, it, throughout various parts of the tree, particularly any place where there's a crook in the branch. And, um, what I'll do is I'll start applying a dormant spray when there's over, it's usually about 70% leaf fall. Um, probably in New York, you, you could do it. Generally, you want to spray when it's over 55 degrees. And so that way there's no chance of, of the, the spray, um, you know, uh, freezing. And um, like I said, Pretty much, almost all the time, I'm using uh, a sulfur spray. Uh, for those of you that are uh, want to treat the trees purely organically, um, 
you know, that I would say you would apply neem at that point. Um, as far as spraying goes, like, I, I just really don't think that if, you know, you're a home orchardist uh, or, you know, this is for a community garden, you do not want to use anything that is going to be damaging to, to people or the environment. So, you know, it, neem will suit your purposes. Basically, um, you know, you can get one of these sprayers at uh, any hardware store for about ten dollars. Um, if you have a lot of trees to spray, this thing I got to get this out because this changed my life last year. I got like the big battery powered sprayer. So uh, typically, to do these trees with that small hand pump sprayer takes me about like five hours. But with this thing, I can knock it out in about forty five minutes. Um, so if you have a lot of trees, I would highly recommend one of the battery powered. But this will suffice if you just have a tree in your yard. Um, if you know, wait as long as you can um, while you still have the weather. And um, what you know, if you're, if I'm spraying neem, um, even if I'm spraying neem, I'll make sure that. I have uh, safety glasses over my regular glasses. I'll have rubber gloves on. Um, I'll make sure that my shirt sleeves are covered, my head's covered. Um, this is just horticultural oil, so I'm not too concerned. And this is purely for demonstration. Um, so when I'm spraying the tree, what I'll do is I start at the, at the bottom and I start working my way up. And what I'll do is I go in and I just follow out the branches. And you can see, I don't have it on continuously. I just hold that trigger enough to get the branch. The other thing that you're seeing is a lot of overspray. And what I do is I, I work my way around the tree so that overspray isn't blowing off of the tree, it's blowing back to the center. Because by the time I'm done, if I go around the tree, That overspray, I won't have to spray the top sides of any of the branches. And that's a way that you can cut down on how much of any given chemical that you're going to use to spray on these. So hopefully by the time I make it around this tree, one of the things that you're going to see is that the tops of the branches are all saturated. And so it's pretty quick. I'll just go around and see. There might be some spots on the tops of um, these uh, these little spikes that come off, and these spikes are uh, where plum trees really produce a lot of fruit. So if there's a couple spots, I'll just go in and hit them, but I really didn't use much liquid at all to, to spray that tree out. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Can you safely use the same sprayer from multiple products, the neem, sulfur, copper, and others, provided you wash it out well when you switch out the spray? Yeah, I mean, you, you can. Um, I, I generally, I tend to keep things designated because they're only, each sprayer is like $10, but it's probably because I'm doing a lot, but you, you could wash them out uh, pretty thoroughly. And then one um, more quick question from earlier. Um, yeah. Someone was told to thin out peach trees so that each peach was one hand fist away from another one. Is something like that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good measurement. Yeah, and, and with peaches specifically, um, peaches, uh, they don't get that really nice cheek on them unless they're getting that full sun. So, you know, as you're starting to kind of like think about spacing them out, um, that the fist size is really, is, is really a good kind of um, good measurement. And I mean, it depends, like I've seen orchards in, uh, outside of Beijing where they even wrap the individual peaches um so you can get you can go all the way <laughs> if you really wanted to start to get crazy with it 
All right, and with the sprays, um, if you don't use all of the mixture, does it last? Can you store it somehow, or do you have to get rid of it and start over with the, the recipe again? Um, it depends. I would look at the instructions on it. Um, you know, the try to make only as much as you're going to use um, because you don't, you know, you don't want to necessarily be storing it. Um, some mixtures will actually start to separate, but for like neem oil, horticultural oil, uh, those things will all, um, those will all keep just as long as you stir them. Um, yeah, stir them pretty well. Hank, hey, come here. Sorry about that. That was... <laughs> That's kind of the biggest pest <laughs> uh, that I have here. Um, it's a cutie, though. Okay, it depends. <laughs> yeah, no, he's adorable. <laughs> no, it's like we have this whole thing where, like, he digs holes and I fill them. It's, uh, yeah. So um, in addition to, you know, if, if you really want to go with a holistic treatment, again, I would recommend you to the Holistic Orchard Network. They have a really amazing, um, they call it like a horticultural sp or a holistic spraying mix, which involves fish oil and neem um, and a couple, a couple other nutrients. Uh, you know, I'm always trying to get away with like as little as I can possibly do with my trees to still make sure that they get, um, you know, the, the protection that they need. I, I just found that anytime you introduce something into the ecosystem, that's something that you're going to have to react and respond to later on, whether beneficial or not. And then finally, the last thing that I'm looking for in, um, to do in October is uh, plant trees. So I, anymore, I've, I've switched to planting in October. I might do it in March, but I, I won't plant trees past sort of mid to the end of March. Um, so yeah, that that's um, that's kind of it. I guess it's time for questions. Mara. Awesome. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you, Sam. Um, yeah. <laughs> virtual round of applause for you. This was really fun. <laughs> um, we can do grafting if you want next. If people want to stick around for that, or I can do questions too. Let's do questions on the topic so far. So everyone, please okay. put your questions in the chat. And then um, if there are no more questions, we'll move on to grafting. Um, so one question, where do you get super dwarf rootstock? Ah, uh, okay. So um, there's uh, some good, so places that I buy my rootstock from are first and foremost rain tree nurseries. They're out in Washington. Um, they are kind of like an amazing resource for the, for sort of home orchard people. Um, and then um, other places like if like if Rain Tree will sell you uh, rootstock for small quantities, but other than that, then you're looking at industrial sources like Birchell Nurseries in California. Um, I'll get a lot of um, rootstock from, but you have to buy a minimum of like 50. The other place to look to is uh, Cummins Nursery in Ithaca, New York. Uh, they're a great source for anything related to apples. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Um, what time of year should we prune a sweet cherry? I've read only in late summer. Yeah, that, I mean, it depends. I prune my cherries, um, you know, I, I prune, like heavy, heavy pruning I'll do in January. And then, um, you know, I'll, I, I can also do it sort of in fall. Basically, you're looking at either doing it, um, you know, before it goes, really goes into dormancy or afterwards. One of the things, like, I'm growing in a pretty cold climate. Um, so one of the things that I'll do, no matter what stone fruit it is, is if you look closely on here, I leave an inch, uh, about an inch of the branch, 
and I prune it off and I seal it right away. And, you know, waiting till January till like the heaviest part of the, the winter is over um, and then sealing it, even if the, that branch starts to have dieback, it's not going to go back into this primary scaffolding branch. David wants to know if you can still get good buffalo wings upstate via takeout. Oh, <laughs> that's kind of the last thing that I was thinking. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I think it's like after you live upstate long enough, you're like the last thing uh, that, you, you, that you want is like more wings. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm a transplant here, so maybe that's just me. All right, we have a couple more questions. If fruit trees haven't fruited, when do you decide when to start over? Oh. Renee, do you Jeez, understand this question? Okay, question. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't, boy. Um, okay, first thing I would do is get a soil test and see what, what the soil looks like. Um, one of the things with doing a soil test is it's gonna tell you uh, what, the, what you need to amend it with. So it'll tell you what minerals are uh, not there and you can, you know, that that's like sort of the first step. Make sure it's getting enough fertilizer unless it's a peach. If it's a peach and you've been fertilizing it a lot, that's the problem. Secondly, other things you can do is you can start to kind of cincture the tree. Um, and this is like excessive stuff. Um, I've never done this, like, so I've, take this with like a grain of you know caution but um first thing is is i use all of these little tree tags i was going to talk about this when we get to grafting um but one of the things you can do is the, they have these little metal bands um what i do is that you know when you're creating a multi-grafted tree one variety is going to grow a lot uh more readily than the other and i can use these to start to cincture it uh, if you know you're having a variety that you want to get fruit to above um, one of the spikes where you see a bud cluster you can start to cincture that a little bit and you, you're going to want to watch this a lot because you can kill the upper part of the branch um, but you can kind of force more nutrients to to those fruit bearing buds so that's another thing and then finally before this is like the last measure before you cut it out Apparently this is, you know, and this, I haven't done this. So this is just something that I heard. But you come up about six to eight inches above the, uh, above the graft knot. And what you do is you cut halfway around in this direction. You go up six inches and you cut halfway around in that direction. And supposedly somehow that reorganizes the tree. But that, that's like an old orchard -ish trick that I haven't. I haven't tried personally, so definitely grain of salt. We have a participant who tried to Google Holistic Orchard Network and came up with a website that's just groworganicapples.com. Do you know how people would find out more about oh. the Holistic Orchard Network? Is that a website or like a Facebook yeah, group? Probably, uh, it's, it's a website. I'll, let me check and I'll, I can send you the website that you could share with people. Maybe we'll do that afterwards, but yeah. All right, sounds good. Um, can you describe what apple scab is, what causes it, and how to prevent it? Yeah, you'll get scab on um, on the leaves. So pretty much that's going to be like a, a reddish, kind of like red-brown spot. Not to be confused, like um, you can get um, cedar rust. So if yeah, I have cedar trees, and then I'm growing apple trees. So I get the cedar rust, which is actually looks like rust. But scab is more of like, it's a red black that starts to form on the leaves and then it gradually moves over to, um, to the apple itself. And what you wanna do is that's definitely something that can be controlled with sulfur and with uh, ready applications of neem throughout, you know, both dormant, spring, and um, yeah, throughout, uh, you know, petal fall. And, and full cover. Would you recommend the same for apple cedar rust, um, which one of our participants has a serious problem with and also has it on their June berries? Yeah, that's like when you wanna go, well, I don't know. 
Well, it's pretty funny because the the nursery out on Governor's Island, I always used to think that if you remove the cedar trees that were in close proximity to the tree, that would take care of it. Um, but on Governor's Island, the interesting thing is that there are two cedar trees that are about a half mile from the nursery and they, the trees still got cedar rust. Um, you know, that that's something that's just, you, you know, apply neem and, you know, hope for the best with it. Yeah, because it's, if you live in a neighborhood, it's, you're going to get it. There's going to be things in the environment that are going to keep um, popping up. What do you use to seal your pruning cuts with? That's a good question. Um, and I have it like right here. So um, I use uh, an asphalt based sealer. Um, so that's what it looks like after it gets used, but that's kind of what it looks like readily. And then I made up, um, I brought them, I made up a whole bunch of backs, batches of wax or grafting sealant or pruning sealant um, for the demo that we did back in, was that January already? Um, so these are from old books. So this is uh, Cox's uh, 1808 mixture. Cole has a mixture from 1858. And A.J. Downing, who uh, was uh, from Hudson Valley, they all had these different mixtures that include using pine rosin, uh, beeswax, and lamb tallow. So I started using those this year to test them out. So we'll see, but they, they tend to look you got to heat them up a little bit, but they tend to look something like that. The reason why I've been using the asphalt base, and I, I might um, start to put soot in these, is that, um, again, you know, I'm in upstate New York, and I believe that the uh, by putting black, uh, that asphalt base, the black will heat up quicker. Um, you know, you can use a uh, latex paint as another sealer. Um, I wouldn't use white latex paint. Use a darker color, uh, you know, and, and you can promote the uh, the healing of the wound. Thank you. I think that's it for yeah. questions, unless anyone has anything else. Hot damn, covering a lot here. Can you All go? Right. Can you go over again how the whitewashing how the whitewashing deters pests? Oh, okay. So um, if you have uh, so it, there's like all different types. There's essentially like three different types of insects that are gonna affect a fruit tree. There's ones that are gonna attack the the foliage, um, so all of your leaves. There's others that are gonna attack the fruit, and then there's others that are gonna attack the trunk. Um, or the root system. The ones that are going to attack the trunk or the root system are borers. Um, so whitewashing will help uh, prevent those borers from getting a hold. So, you know, if you look at the texture of the, the of a tree, like this is a pretty good trunk. Like there isn't a whole lot of texture to it. Um, if you have cherry trees, like cherry trees actually start to, the bark will come up a little bit. It has more texture. And that's where uh, some of those borers gain access into the tree. In addition to that, it's also a spot where some of those insects, which are gonna affect the, um, the leaves of the tree are just gonna hang out over winter, right? Because it's like a protected area. and and by just painting it, you're getting something that fills in those cracks and, and prevents the, uh, you know, prevents insects from hanging out there. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's the proper pronunciation of the McCoon apple? Is it McCown oh. or McCoon? I think you have, I've heard, I don't know, that always depends, like, I'm always pronouncing things wrong, so I'm not even going to, like, venture, uh, <laughs> I, I would probably go with McCown, but, it's like, you know, I, there's apricots and apricots, and apparently I say that wrong, so, uh -huh. yeah. All right, last question, what is the best way to store clippings to be used the following season? Oh, okay, so, um, yeah, those, I, 
um, again, like I use, so again, this is sort of the method that I use for collecting branches. So it's a plastic bag. It has a damp, but not wet piece of cloth in it. I seal the bag, keep it at, you know, third, you know, 36 to 38 degrees in a refrigerator and that holds it. That said, I was in um, Switzerland recently and I was uh, talking with a guy that what he does is he'll go out and this is only with apple clippings. He'll go out and take the apple, uh, any of the scion wood that he collects and he stores them in the snow on the north side of his house. Never lost any uh, scion wood for, for grafting. Wow. So, yeah, but it's cold there, so. All right, thank you.